the story repeat. Oh, will you not tell it today? Will you not tell it today? If the light of his presence has brightened your way, oh, will you not tell it today? If the souls all around you are living in sin, if the master has told you to bid them come in, if the sweet invitation they never have heard, oh, will you not tell them the cheering word? Oh. Philadelphia Eagles tonight. And Jesus did not write a letter to the church in Kansas City. Tonight is my annual lesson from one of the judges. So if you have a copy of the sermon outline, you know it's going to be from Judges chapter 11. So turn in your copy of God's Word to Judges chapter 11. <clears throat> have you ever done anything impulsive? Can y'all hear me okay back there? Marvin says so-so. May want to turn me up just a little bit. Have you ever done anything impulsive? I've said before that I don't do anything spontaneous unless I can put it on the calendar. I just don't do things on the spur of the moment. But how much do we do that? How, much, how, how often do we think through our actions? How frequently do we think through the repercussions of our actions before we do something? Jephthah is a judge that we're going to look at tonight. And you know the story of the judges, how for a period of time they are faithful to God, maybe for decades. But then when things go well for them, they turn to sin. They turn their back on God. And God raises up some nation that enslaves them, and then they become slaves again for sometimes several decades. And then they cry out to God for deliverance, and God raises up a judge. The judge frees them, and then they stay faithful to God for a while. Does that describe you and me? Sometimes... Faithful, things go well, then we sin, and then things go badly. And then we go to God, and He forgives us, and then things start going well again. The cycle of the judges is our individual life written on a large scale. The, the whole nation of Israel is like that. And so we look at uh, Jephthah tonight, and, and in chapter 11 we see what was going on with the, the judges before Jephthah comes along. Now, Jephthah is mentioned 29 times in the Bible. Most of those times are here in chapter 11. He's mentioned in chapter 12. Uh, Samuel will refer to Jephthah in 1 Samuel chapter 12 in a speech he gives. And we'll point out at the end of our study tonight from Hebrews chapter 11 that whatever you want to say about Jephthah after we study, and you know his story, if you read Judges, you know his story. Whatever we want to say about Jephthah, he's listed in the hall of the faithful in Hebrews chapter 11. And sometimes that causes us to scratch our heads what God saw to praise in Jephthah. Now before we get to chapter 11, I want to point out some things in chapter 10. Because the historian, whoever he may have been, set some things up in chapter 10. Notice in verse 6 of chapter 10 that the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of God. 
They forsook the Lord and did not serve Him at the end of uh, verse 10. And so the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and He raised up the nation of Ammon, the sons of Ammon. The sons of Ammon afflict Israel and crush Israel, verse 8, for 18 years. Which means that if you were born at the beginning of that period of time, you are graduating from high school before you stop serving the Ammonites. That's a long time. So you're a high school graduate and you haven't known anything but serving Ammon. And so the sons of Ammon are oppressing Israel and Israel cries out to God. And notice what God says in verse 11. Did I not already deliver you? I delivered you from their hands at the end of, at the end of verse 12. And then in verse 13, God says, I'm not going to deliver you anymore. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of your foolishness. And God says, you go cry out to the gods that you serve. Go ask the God of the Moabites and the God of the Ammonites, all of these other gods. You go to them for deliverance. You bunch of knuckleheads. You can just see God saying that, can't you? Verse 16 says that they cried out to God so much that God could not bear the crying out any longer. And God acts. You remember Jesus gives us the parable in uh, Luke chapter 18 about the persistent widow. Persist and persist and persist and God will finally give in. Here's the Israelites persisting and persisting and persisting. God saying no, no, no. And then God says, okay. Because God's a God of love and he's a God of forgiveness. So chapter 11 is the story of Jephthah who leads Israel to freedom from the Ammonites. But the story of Jephthah that we remember is not him leading the, the Israel to freedom from the Ammonites. It's that vow that he made. And I think that vow, because it takes up so much of the text in chapter 11, that's the reason why God gives it to us. And that's why we're studying that tonight. When you were a child, did you tell what are called anti-jokes? They're jokes that they're funny, but they end with somebody dying or somebody getting an appendage cut off or something like that. And you laugh because it's funny, but then you think, well, I shouldn't be laughing because some tragedy happened. Well, it's called an anti-joke. Well, Jephthah is the anti-judge. He's known for a bad thing. He's not known so much for the good he did. He's known more for the bad he did. So let's begin reading verses 1 through 3. We have an introduction to Jephthah. The historian says Jephthah the Gileadite was a valiant warrior. He was a valiant warrior. And the historian tells us that because that's the reason why the men of Gilead, the elders of Gilead, go after him to lead them in the battle against Ammon. So that's an important point to remember. But he was a son of a harlot. And the reason why that point is brought up is because that leads his brothers to kick him out. They send him away. Notice what happens. Gilead was the father of Jephthah. Gilead's wife bore him sons. When his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out. And said to him, you shall not have an inheritance in our father's house. For you are the son of another woman. So because he was the odd man out, he, he was uh, not the, the legitimate son of his dad, then his other brothers drive him out. And they say, you're not going to inherit our father's inheritance along with us. And so verse 3, Jephthah flees from his brothers, and he lived in the land of Tol, which interestingly in the Hebrew language means good. So he lived in a good land. But worthless fellows, literally the Hebrew says empty fellows, empty men, gathered themselves about Jephthah and they went out with him. Now the historian brings that point up to help the reader understand that Jephthah is a warrior and Jephthah is a leader. So these worthless men follow Jephthah's leadership and going out and coming in refers to uh, going out to battle, going to plunder other villages. Maybe the Ammonites, it doesn't matter who they plunder at this particular point, is simply showing that Jephthah was a leader. And is a, he was a valiant warrior. But now we come to the problem with the Ammonites. 
And that's why Jephthah is brought into the picture. So beginning in verse 4, we have in the face of war, the elders of Gilead, the family that drove Jephthah out, go to Jephthah and say, uh, we need your leadership. Verse 4. It came about after a while that the sons of Ammon fought against Israel. When the sons of Ammon fought against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob, and they said to Jephthah, Come and be our chief, that, that we may fight against the sons of Ammon. Now, the, the word chief here probably refers to a military leader. And we probably drew that from the context. I'll bring that point up because we make another point in just a moment. So verse 7, Jephthah said to the elders of Iliad, uh, Gilead, Did you not hate me and drive me out from my father's house? So why have you come to me now when you are in trouble? Okay, I see you're in trouble. Now you're coming and asking at my door. What's the deal? So the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, For this reason we have now returned to you, that you may go with us and fight with the sons of Ammon and become head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Notice that they use a different word for leader. Here they use the word head. Now, it might be synonymous, but it also might be that head refers to more of a political head, leader, over all of us as opposed to just the military leader. Either way, they need Jephthah's leadership. The Gileadites do not have a leader. And so they run Jephthah off, and now they're having to go beg him to come back. And so verse 9, Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you take me back to fight against the sons of Ammon, and the Lord gives them up to me, will I become your head? Is that the agreement that we have going on here? Are we on the same page? And so the elders of uh, Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord is witness between us. Surely we will do as you have said. Here is the first oath that we have in the text. The Lord is witness. That's an oath. That is oath language. So we are making an oath in the presence of Jehovah God. Surely we will do as you have said. If you come to us and be our leader, we will make you our head. I have on the screen, verse 10 literally says... Jehovah is a listener. New American Standard translates it as witness. The, the Hebrew says a listener between us. And so it's an oath in the presence of God. So verse 11, Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and chief. If certain Hebrew scholars are correct, then they made him both the political leader and the military leader of the city of Gilead and its surrounding area. Everybody that looks to them for leadership. So the people made him head and chief over them. And notice the second reference to making an oath in the text. Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mizpah. So Jephthah makes this promise in front of the Lord. In other words, he's making an oath at Mizpah. Now at the end of chapter 10, we saw where the sons of Ammon had come against the sons of Israel. And Israel was camping at Mizpah. So Jephthah is there with the other the, the other Israelites, the Gileadites, they're at Mizpah. Now, Mizpah had a long history among the patriarchs in the, uh, the book of Genesis. And in fact, it was the place where Jacob and Laban made a non-aggression pact with each other when Jacob left his father-in-law's house. And so now Jephthah is making an oath to serve the Gileadites, the Israelites, in their battle against the Ammonites. Now, beginning in verse 12, we have Jephthah extending an olive branch. That's just good diplomacy, right? Department of State. Before the Department of War goes to battle, the Department of State goes to work. Let's extend an olive branch. Let's see if we can work our disagreements out without war. So in verse 12, Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the sons of Ammon saying, What is between you and me? What is up that you have come to me to fight against my land? Why are you fighting against us? So the king of the sons of Ammon said to the messengers of Jephthah, Because Israel took away my land. 
How many wars have been fought over land? How many wars have been thought, fought over resources? You've got to have resources. You've got to have land to grow our crops. got to have a source of water. So Ammon said, you, you took away our land. When you came out of Egypt, when you came out of Egypt, you took away our land. He says, from the Arnon as far as the Jabbok and the Jordan, therefore return them peaceably now. Here's our deal. You give us back this land, and we'll stop fighting. It's as simple as that. The problem was the sons of Ammon were making an argument that was historically incorrect. Let's keep reading and look at Jephthah's response. Let's set the record straight. Verse 14. Jephthah sent messengers again to the king of the sons of Ammon. And they said to him, to the king, Thus says Jephthah, Israel did not take away the land of Moab, nor the land of the sons of Ammon. You may remember, now we studied this in our Wednesday night class several months ago because we studied through the book of Numbers. And why do we study through the book of Numbers? Because that helps us to understand the book of Judges. So in the book of Numbers, we read where God led Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. And at Kadesh, they asked Edom if they could pass through that land. And Edom said no. And so Israel said, okay, we'll take the long way around. And then Israel comes to the land of Moab. And they ask the Moabites, according to the story in Numbers, can we pass through your land? And Moses offered to pay for their food and water. Any resources we use, we will pay for them. And Moab said no. And Moses says, okay, we'll go around. I'm reading back in the text, verse 16. Jephthah said, for when they came up from Egypt and Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea and came to Kadesh... Then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, Please let us pass through your land. But the king of Edom would not listen. And they also sent to the king of Moab, but he would not consent. So Israel remained at Kadesh. And then they went through the wilderness and around the land of Edom and around the land of Moab. And they came to the east side of the land of Moab. And they camped beyond the Arnon. But they did not enter the territory of Moab, for the Arnon was the border of Moab. Now notice back up in verse 13 that Ammon is complaining that Israel took Arnon. Well, Jephthah here says we camped at Arnon, but we did not go past that because it was the land of Moab. Verse 19. Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, the king of Heshbon, and Israel said to him, please let us pass through your land to our place. The place that God had promised to us. But Sihon, verse 20 did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. So Sihon gathered all his people and camped in Jahaz and fought with Israel. And let me just take a little side note here. Sihon and Og are the two most well-known kings in the Old Testament that you've never heard a sermon on. Those two men are mentioned over and over and over again in the Old Testament, and I have never heard a sermon on and I've never preached a sermon on them. But it was an event in the life of Israel that God felt was important enough to remind Israel over and over again that I defeated Sihon and Og at your hands. And that's why you need to trust me and obey me. So Jephthah here brings up Sihon and he brings him up because Jephthah also has the book of Numbers and he studied it on Wednesday night synagogue class. No, really he didn't because synagogue wasn't created at that point. But he knew the story of Israel. And so he reminds the Ammonites of what is going on historically. So verse 21, the Lord, the God of Israel, gave Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel. And they defeated them. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorites, the inhabitants of that country. Notice verse 22. So they possessed all the territory of the Amorites from, notice the, the boundary markers, from the Arnon as far as the Jabbok and from the wilderness as far as the Jordan. In other words, the land that you said we took when we came out of Egypt, you didn't own it in the first place. And God gave it to us because Sihon, who owned the land, fought with us with us out, without us trying to pick a, a fight with them. And God defeated them at our hands and then gave us their land. Did you follow that? So the land did not even belong to the Ammonites at the time Israel took possession of the land. 
And Israel wasn't trying to take possession of the land. They were going to go around the land, but Sihon picked the fight. And so that's the reason why God gave the land to Israel. Verse 23. Since now the Lord, the God of Israel, drove out the Amorites from before his people Israel, are you then to possess it? Do you not possess what Kamosh your God gives you to possess? So whatever the Lord our God has driven out before us, we will possess it. Now this doesn't mean that Jephthah believes Kamosh is a, a real God. Kamosh is actually the God of the Moabites, not the Ammonites. But they shared gods back then. And so if Kamosh gave the land of the Moabites to the Ammonites, big deal, Jephthah is saying, Jehovah God gave that land to us. So what are you going to do about it? So whatever the Lord our God has driven out before us, we will possess it. That's verse 24. Verse 25. Now, are you any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Now, y'all remember that story, right? That's Numbers chapters 22 through 24. Did he ever strive with Israel or did he ever fight against them? Balak didn't. He tried to get Balaam to curse Israel and he failed, remember? While Israel lived in Heshbon and its villages and in Aurora and its villages and in all the cities that are on the banks of the Arnon 300 years, one of the very few chron chronological references in the Old Testament. So this puts Jephthah living around 1100 B.C., 1200 B.C. If Moses led Israel out of the land of Egypt around 1500 B.C., those dates are notoriously difficult to pinpoint. So, Jephthah says, we've been living here for 300 years. 300 years. Why did you not recover them within that time? Verse 26. Why have you all of a sudden decided today to come take possession of this land? Verse 27. I therefore have not sinned against you, which implies your war with us is not just. But you are doing me wrong by making war against me. May the Lord, the judge, notice Jephthah refers to God as the judge. That's the capital J, judge. The Lord, the judge, may he judge today between the sons of Israel and the sons of Ammon. In other words, if we go to war, which you want to do, Whoever wins, his God's the real God. That's the message that Jephthah is giving. And so he calls on Jehovah God to bring them victory in battle. Verse 28, the king of the sons of Ammon disregarded the message which Jephthah sent him. When you need resources, logic and common sense and historical accuracy don't matter. You're going to take the land. And so, Israel is again drawn into a war that they did not seek. Verse 29 tells us that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. The Holy Spirit came on Othniel back in chapter 3. The Holy Spirit came on Gideon in chapter 6. There are several references to the Holy Spirit strengthening Samson, which is interesting considering Samson, Samson's behavior. So the Holy Spirit comes on Jephthah probably, and there's no details given relative to the Holy Spirit in Jephthah, but probably to give him knowledge about military practices and uh, whatever it takes to be victorious, courage, whatever it takes to be victorious in battle. The Holy Spirit empowers Jephthah. So Jephthah passed through, I'm reading verse 29, Jephthah passed through Gilead and Manasseh. He passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he went on to the sons of Ammon. So what he was doing was gathering up an army. He's gathering an army, and he's going to Mizpah in order to fight against the Ammonites. Now in chapter 12, we got some of the Israelites who were not asked to go to war with them, who whine and complain and pick a fight with Jephthah because he didn't ask them to go to war. Isn't it funny how adults act like children sometimes? And so verse 30, and verse 30, verse 30 is it. Verse 30, verse 30 is the verse that confounds the Bible student about Jephthah. 
In verse 30, Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give the sons of Ammon into my hand, then it shall be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. What was going through Jephthah's head when he said that? I'll tell you what probably was not going through his head. He wasn't thinking an animal was going to come out of the house and meet him. I wonder if he was thinking a servant was going to come out of the house and meet him. What he was not thinking is that his daughter was going to come out of the house and meet him. So he says, and he makes his vow to the Lord, whatever comes out of my house, I'm going to offer it to the Lord and offer it as a burnt offering. Burnt offerings under the law of Moses were totally burned up on the altar. Bones and meat, everything was burned up on the altar. The Hebrew word actually gives us the English word holocaust. Jephthah swore to God that he would offer as a burnt offering whatever came out of the doors of his house if God gave him victory. So Satan has now instigated this war. All war comes from Satan. is instigated by Satan. For the, for the Ammonites to fight with Israel in order for them to enlarge their land for resources. Now, Ammon is going to lose the land. Ammon, of course, loses the battle. Because God fights on the side of Israel. And we always see Satan losing. He wins battles sometimes. But he always loses the war. And, of course, the book of Revelation tells us that he loses in the end. So now Jephthah has this vow that's floating around. And in verse 34, 32, excuse me, Jephthah crossed over to the sons of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. Now, did the Lord give Ammon into Jephthah's hands because of the vow? Or despite the vow. God gave Jephthah the victory. Verse 33 details. He struck them with a very great slaughter. From a roar to the entrance of Mineth. Twenty cities and as far as abel Karamim. So the sons of Ammon were subdued before the sons of Israel. They came fighting for land. And they don't not only lose the land they wanted from Israel. But they lost their own land. Or at least part of it. Notice the passage. On the screen from Numbers, Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes and the sons of Israel, saying, This is the word which the Lord has commanded. If a man makes a vow to the Lord, or takes an oath to bind himself with a binding obligation, he shall not violate his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. It's not a sin to make a vow in the eyes of God. It's a sin to break a vow. That you've made in the eyes of God. Solomon writes in Ecclesiastes. When you make a vow to God. Do not be late in paying it. For he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow. Than that you should vow and not pay. So God has given Jephthah victory. Just like Jephthah asked. Give me victory and I'll offer whatever comes out of the door of my house. As a burnt offering. Verse 34. When Jephthah came to his house at Mizpah, notice the text says, Behold. If we were uh, among the original audience and we were listening to this story being told or being read out of a scroll, that word, Behold, would draw our attention. It's like a preacher pounding on the pulpit. Listen to this. What happens? His daughter. His daughter was coming out to meet him with tambourines and with dancing to emphasize the relationship between Jephthah and his daughter. The historian says she was his one and only child. Besides her, he had no son or daughter. Three times he emphasizes she's it. She was his only child. No other daughter, no son. Now what's Jephthah going to do? 
Verse 35. When he saw her, he tore his clothes. So whatever was going through his mind when he made that vow, apparently he did not imagine that his daughter would be the first thing out of his house. He tore his clothes. And he said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. Now, are you asking yourself, Jephthah, you're the one that made the vow. Why are you blaming her? I don't know what's going through his mind. I don't know what was going through Lot's mind when he offered his daughters to the, the rapist in Gomorrah. I don't know what was going through his mind. So Jephthah says, I've made this vow to the Lord and I cannot take it back. In the book of Leviticus, in the law of Moses, God says, you shall not give any of your offspring to offer them to Molech or to any other god, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You do not offer human sacrifices. The law of Moses was just as strict against making vows and then not fulfilling them as it was against offering human sacrifices. Again, Leviticus chapter 20, verses 2 through 5. We won't take the time to read that text there. But the law of Moses was adamant. You don't offer human sacrifices. They cannot take away sin. Verse 36. The daughter says to him, My father, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me as you've said. And that doesn't that make you want to say, Do you know what he said? <laughs> Do you understand the implications of this? Since the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the sons of Ammon. Dad, do what you promised. She said to her father, verse 37, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone. For two months, that I may go to the mountains and weep because of my virginity, I and my companions. He said, go. So he sent her away for two months, and she left with her companions, and wept of the mountains because of her virginity. At the end of two months, she returned to her father, who did to her according to the vow which he had made. If you're counting, there are six references to vows in this chapter. Four of them are references to the vow that Jephthah made. And then the other two that I mentioned earlier in the chapter. Four references to that vow. For some reason, that's the reason why this story is in the Bible. Because of that vow that he made. And that he kept that vow. Verse 39, at the end of two months, she returned to her father who did to her according to the vow which he had made. She had no relations with a man. And he offered her as a burnt offering. That's the only conclusion I can draw. I wrote this sermon two weeks ago before we left to go to lectureship. I've meditated on it for the last 10 days or whatever. I can draw no other conclusion than that he put her on the altar and he lit a fire under his daughter. And he heard her screaming and he smelled her burning flesh because he made this rash vow. To God. Thus it became a custom in Israel, verse 40, that the daughters of Israel went yearly to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days in the year. So his daughter laments the fact that she cannot get married. She laments the fact that she cannot become a mom. She laments the fact that there's not going to be anybody to carry on the name. And the daughters of Israel remember as a memorial for four days each year the daughter of Jephthah and what happened to her. Now, we don't have any other reference to this. So we don't know how it played out in reality in Israelite history. This is it. This is all the story we have of it. And so I ask myself, why did God want this story in the Bible? Both for the Israelites 
and for every generation after them that would read this story. Why? Why does God dedicate 10, 12 verses to this vow? Now back in Leviticus chapter 27, there seems to be a method of dealing with undoing a vow in Leviticus chapter 27. Now how that text relates to this situation, I don't know. If I had had an ignorant spell like Jephthah did and did something stupid like that, I would have been going to the high priest and say, talk to God for me to get me out of this mess I put myself in. Isn't it great sometimes, don't you make some bad decision sometimes and then somehow or another God works it out in your life where you don't feel the consequences of that stupid decision. And it happened to me. And I think, wow, I'm glad God's watching over me because I'm an idiot. Just because somebody is sincere as Jephthah was does not mean they're making right decisions in the eyes of God. Jephthah is anxious to win over the Ammonites. Jephthah is anxious for that. Jephthah wants to lead his, his, his compatriots to victory. He probably wants to be the head and chief over his family that kicked him out. He probably wants legitimation. He wants vindication in the eyes of his family. I'm guessing the motivation for making such a vow. But he made it. And then rather than trying to figure out some way to undo it, he fulfills it. And he offers a human sacrifice. <coughs> You'll notice in chapter 12 and verse 7, in contrast to the other judges, after Jephthah rules as a judge, they don't have decades of peace. They don't have 40 years of rest as other judges led. At the end of Jephthah's service, verse 7 of chapter 12 says, Jephthah judged Israel six years. Jephthah Gilead, Gilead died and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. And that's the end of the story. No rest. Nothing positive that comes out of it as far as the text is concerned. They subdued Ammon, but for six years. But then you've got that pesky verse of Hebrews. Just when we want to walk away from the story and say Jephthah was an idiot and he made a bash row and he's probably burning in hell, the Hebrew writer praises his faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. Now what do you make about that? Does the story of Jephthah teach us that God can use us to do good despite the bad we do? Just like with Rahab. A lot of people want to point to Rahab to the fact that she lied and say, look, we've got, you can lie in certain situations because Rahab did and God praises Rahab. God didn't praise Rahab for lying. He praised Rahab for her faith, for her trust that the God of Israel is going to take over the land. And she begs the, the Israelite spies to save her life. The Bible praises Rahab's faith, not her lying. I think that's what we've got going on here with Jephthah. Hebrews 11 praises Jephthah's faith. He believed God could give him the victory. He should have left the bow out. That's what he should have done. And of course, having made the vow, then he should have gone back to God and said, man, I messed up. How can I undo it? And let God give him an answer rather than taking the decision in his own hands. And that's another story for us today. Rather than trying to give good answers to religious questions, we should give Bible answers to religious questions. Go back to God and quote God. You can't mess up if you quote God. So we see in Jephthah that even good guys have flaws. One of the appealing characteristics about the Marvel movie characters is that the good guys have flaws. And the bad guys have redeeming qualities. 
a lot of times in the Marvel movies and Marvel comic books, and, and I subscribe to Spider-Man and a couple of West Coast Avengers and a couple other comic books when I was a kid, a lot of the bad guys have a history behind them that makes you sympathetic to their behavior. It doesn't justify their behavior, but it makes you sympathetic towards their behavior. In the Civil War, Avengers Civil War was, was Captain America versus Iron Man. And when Jared took the young people to see that movie, there was a debate over who was going to win in the end. Jared said, duh, it's called Captain America Civil War. But we have two superheroes that get in a fight with each other because they're letting their egos get in the way of what's good. The good guys have flaws. The bad guys have redeeming qualities. Even the worst of the worst have probably some redeeming qualities. So I think God, through Jephthah, brought rest to Israel, even if it was only six years, despite that bad decision he made. Now you and I are not in the same category as Jephthah as far as that's concerned, but we still have our flaws. I think the message Jephthah gives to us today is that God can still use us. Even though we've got the flaws. If we're willing to allow God to use us for His glory, He can do it. We just have to submit to Him. Do His things His way. And He'll use us. As you reflect on your life tonight and decisions you've made, if you need the prayers of the church, if you need God's forgiveness for anything in your life, the elders stand ready to pray for you. The church is ready to pray for you. If we can help, let us know. Let's stand. All things are ready.